Section six of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. The Glamour of the Snow. Chapter One. Hibbert, always conscious of two worlds, was in this mountain village, conscious of three. It lay on the slopes of the Valley Alps, and he had taken a room in the little post office where he could be at peace to write his book, yet at the same time enjoy the winter sports and find companionship in the hotels when he wanted it. The three worlds that met and mingled here seemed to his imaginative temperament very obvious though it is doubtful if another mind, less intuitively equipped, would have seen them so well defined. There was the world of tourist English, civilized, quasi-educated, to which he belonged by birth, at any rate. There was the world of peasants, to which he felt himself drawn by sympathy, for he loved and admired their toiling simple life. And there was this other, which he could only call the world of nature, to this last, however, in virtue of a vehement poetic imagination and a tumultuous pagan instinct fed by his very blood, he felt that most of him belonged. The others borrowed from it, as it were, for visits. Here, with the soul of nature, hid his central life. Between all three was conflict, potential conflict. On the skating rink each Sunday, the tourists regarded the natives as intruders. In the church, the peasants plainly questioned, Why do you come? We are here to worship. You to stare and whisper? For neither of these two worlds accepted the other, and neither did nature accept the tourists, for it took advantage of their least mistakes. And indeed, even if the peasant world accepted only those who were strong and bold enough to invade her savage domain with sufficient skill to protect themselves from several forms of death. Now Hibbert was keenly aware of this potential conflict and want of harmony. He felt outside, and yet caught by it, torn in the three directions because he was partly of each world, but wholly in only one. There grew in him a constant, subtle effort, or at least desire, to unify them, and decide positively to which he should belong and live in. The attempt, of course, was largely subconscious. It was the natural instinct of a richly imaginative nature seeking the point of equilibrium, so that the mind could feel at peace, and his brain be free to do good work. Among the guests, no one especially claimed his interest. The men were nice, but undistinguished. Athletic schoolmasters, doctors, snatching a holiday, good fellows all. The women, equally various, the clever, the would-be fast, the dare to be dull, the women who understood, and the usual pack of jolly dancing girls and flappers, and Hibbert, with his forty-odd years of thick experience behind him, got on well with the lot. He understood them all. They belonged to definite pre-digested types that are the same world over, and that he had met the world over long ago. But to none of them did he belong. His nature was too multiple to subscribe to the set of shibboleths of any one class, and since all liked him, and felt that somehow he seemed outside of them, spectator, looker-on, all sought to claim him. In a sense, therefore, the three worlds fought for him, natives, tourists, nature. It was thus began the singular conflict for the soul of Hibbert. In his own soul, however, it took place. Neither the peasants nor the tourists were conscious that they fought for anything, and nature, they say, is merely blind and automatic. The assault upon him of the peasants may be left out of account, for it is obvious they stood no chance of success. The tourist world, however, made a gallant effort to subdue him to themselves, but the evenings in the hotel, when dancing was not in order, were English. 
the provincial imagination was set upon a throne and worshipped heavily through incense of the stupidest conventions possible hibbert used to go back early to his room in the post office to work it is a mistake on my part to have realized that there is any conflict at all he thought as he crunched home over the snow at midnight after one of the dances it would have been better to have kept outside it all and done my work better he added looking back down the silent village street to the church tower and safer the adjective slipped from his mind before he was aware of it he turned with an involuntary start and looked about him he knew perfectly well what it meant this thought that had thrust its head up from the instinctive region he understood without being able to express it fully the meaning that betrayed itself in the choice of the adjective for if he had ignored the existence of this conflict he would at the same time have remained outside the arena whereas now he had entered the lists now this battle for his soul must have issue and he knew that the spell of nature was greater for him than all other spells in the world combined greater than love revelry pleasure greater even than study he had always been afraid to let himself go his pagan soul dreaded her terrific powers of witchery even while he worshipped the little village already slept the world lay smothered in snow the chalet roofs shone white beneath the moon and pitch black shadows gathered against the walls of the church his eye rested a moment on the square stone tower with its frosted cross that pointed to the sky then traveled with a leap of many thousand feet to the enormous mountains that brushed the brilliant stars like a forest rose the huge peaks above the slumbering village measuring the night and heavens they beckoned him and something born of the snowy desolation born of the midnight and the silent grandeur born of the great listening hollows of the night something that lay twixt terror and wonder dropped from the vast wintry spaces down into his heart and called him very softly unrecorded in any word or thought his brain could compass it laid its spell upon him fingers of snow brushed the surface of his heart the power and quiet majesty of the winter's night appalled him fumbling a moment with a big unwieldy key he let himself in and went upstairs to bed two thoughts went with him apparently quite ordinary and sensible ones what fools these peasants are to sleep through such a night and the other those dances tire me i'll never go again my work only suffers in the morning the claims of peasants and tourists upon him seemed thus in a single instant weakened the clash of battle troubled half his dreams nature had sent her beauty of the night and won the first assault the others routed and dismayed fled far away chapter two don't go back to your dreary old post office we're going to have supper in my room something hot come and join us hurry up there had been an ice carnival and the last party tailing up the snow slope to the hotel called him the chinese lanterns smoked and sputtered on the wires the band had long since gone the cold was bitter and the moon came only momentarily between high driving clouds from the shed where the people changed from skates to snow boots he shouted something to the effect that he was following but no answer came the moving shadows of those who had called were already merged high up against the village darkness the voices died away doors slammed hibbert found himself alone on the deserted rink and it was then quite suddenly the impulse came to stay and skate alone the thought of the stuffy hotel room and of those noisy people with their obvious jokes and laughter oppressed him he felt a longing to be alone with the night to taste her wonder all by himself there beneath the stars gliding over the ice it was not yet midnight and he could skate for half an hour that supper party if they noticed his absence at all would merely think he had changed his mind and gone to bed it was an impulse yes and not an unnatural one 
Yet even at the time it struck him that something more than impulse lay concealed behind it more than an invitation yet certainly less than command there was a vague queer feeling that he stayed because he had to almost as though there was something he had forgotten overlooked left undone imaginative temperaments are often thus and impulse is ever weakness for with such ill-considered opening of the doors to hasty action may come an invasion of other forces at the same time forces merely waiting their opportunity perhaps he caught the fugitive warning even while he dismissed it as absurd and the next minute he was whirling over the smooth ice in delightful curves and loops beneath the moon there was no fear of collision he could take his own speed and space as he willed the shadows of the towering mountains fell across the rink and a wind of ice came from the forests where the snow lay ten feet deep the hotel lights winked and went out the village slept the high wire netting could not keep out the wonder of the winter night that grew about him like a presence he skated on and on keen exhilarating pleasure in his tingling blood and weariness all forgotten and then midway in the delight of rushing movement he saw a figure gliding behind the wire netting watching him with a start that almost made him lose his balance for the abruptness of the new arrival was so unlooked for he paused and stared although the light was dim he made out that it was the figure of a woman and that she was feeling her way along the netting trying to get in against the white background of the snowfield he watched her rather stealthy efforts as she passed with a silent step over the banked up snow she was tall and slim and graceful he could see that even in the dark and then of course he understood it was another adventurous skater like himself stolen down unawares from hotel or chalet and searching for the opening at once making a sign and pointing with one hand he turned swiftly and skated over to the little entrance on the other side but even before he got there there was a sound on the ice behind him and with an exclamation of amazement he could not suppress he turned to see her swerving up to his side across the width of the rink she had somehow found another way in hibbert as a rule was punctilious and in these free and easy places perhaps especially so if only for his own protection he did not seek to make advances unless some kind of introduction paved the way but for these two to skate together in the semi-darkness without speech often of necessity brushing shoulders almost was too absurd to think of accordingly he raised his cap and spoke his actual words he seems unable to recall nor what the girl said in reply except that she answered him in accented english with some commonplace about doing figures at midnight on an empty rink quite natural it was and right she wore gray clothes of some kind though not the customary long gloves or sweater for indeed her hands were bare and presently when he skated with her he wondered with something like astonishment at their dry and icy coldness and she was delicious to skate with supple sure and light fast as a man yet with the freedom of a child sinuous and steady at the same time her flexibility made him wonder and when he asked where she had learned she murmured he caught the breath against his ear and recalled later that it was singularly cold that she could hardly tell for she had been accustomed to the ice ever since she could remember but her face he never properly saw a muffler of white fur buried her neck to the ears and her cap came over the eyes he only saw that she was young nor could he gather her hotel or chalet for she pointed vaguely when he asked her up the slopes just over there she said quickly taking his hand again he did not press her no doubt she wished to hide her escapade and the touch of her hand thrilled him more than anything he could remember even through his thick glove he felt the softness of that cold and delicate softness the clouds thickened over the mountains it grew darker they talked very little and did not always skate together often they separated curving about in corners by themselves but always coming together again in the center of the rink and when she left him thus hibbert was conscious of yes missing her 
he found a peculiar satisfaction, almost a fascination, in skating by her side. It was quite an adventure, these two strangers, with the ice and snow and night. Midnight had long since sounded from the old church tower before they parted. She gave the sign, and he skated quickly to the shed, meaning to find a seat and help her take her skates off. Yet when he turned, she had already gone. He saw her slim figure gliding away across the snow, and hurrying for the last time round the rink alone, he searched in vain for the opening she had twice used in this curious way. How very queer, he thought, referring to the wire netting. She must have lifted it and wriggled under. Wondering how in the world she managed it, what in the world had possessed him to be so free with her, and who in the world she was, he went up the steep slope to the post office, and so to bed, her promise to come again another night still ringing delightfully in his ears, and curious were the thoughts and sensations that accompanied him. Most of all, perhaps, was the half-suggestion of some dim memory that he had known this girl before, had met her somewhere more, that she knew him. For in her voice, a low, soft, windy little voice it was, tender and soothing for all its quiet coldness, there lay some faint reminder of two others he had known, both long since gone, the voice of the woman he had loved, and the voice of his mother. But this time, through his dreams, there ran no clash of battle. He was conscious, rather, of something cold and clinging that made him think of sifting snowflakes climbing slowly with entangling touch and thickness round his feet. The snow, coming without noise, each flake so light and tiny, none can mark the spot whereon it settles, yet the mass of it, able to smother whole villages, wove through the very texture of his mind. Cold, bewildering, deadening effort, with its clinging network of ten million feathery touches. End of chapter 2 of The Glamour of the Snow